I said in an earlier video that there were three classes of multivariable functions in this course, three arenas for understanding how calculus extends. The first was parametric curves, which was covered in the previous week. In parametric curves, there is one variable of input, time t, but several variables of output. In R3, say, the outputs are x of t, y of t, and z of t. In this week, I'm going to introduce the second class of multivariable functions, scalar fields. A scalar field has multiple inputs. In R3 again, say, x, y, and z, but only a single output. The word field, at least in this course, means a function with multiple vari variables of input. A scalar field is a field where the output is a single variable, in vector terms, a scalar, and hopefully that justifies the name. The final class of multivariable functions, which we'll get to in a few weeks, is vector fields, and these have multiple inputs and multiple outputs, but I'll leave those alone for now. So what kind of things are measured by scalar fields? Anything that is a scalar quantity has value but no direction, and depends on more than one input. This doesn't have to be geometric. The inputs can be anything. In physics, some of you may remember that the potential energy of an object of mass m and distance h above the ground is given by the equation mgh, where g is the acceleration due to gravity. This is either a function of two variables, mass and height, or three variables if you care about the variation of the acceleration due to gravity at different altitudes. Potential energy is a scalar, so this is a scalar field in two or three variables. Likewise from physics, some of you may remember that the voltage in a circuit is calculated by the current I multiplied by the resistance R. This is a function of two variables, and the voltage is a scalar, so this is a scalar field in two variables. Still taking physics examples, the force of gravity between two objects is given by the first mass, capital M, times the second mass, lowercase m, times the gravitational constant, g, divided by the distance squared, r squared. If I treat g as a constant, as I should, this is a function of three variables. Force is usually a vector, but this version only gives the magnitude of the force, which is a scalar, so this is a scalar field. You could also think geometrically. The three inputs could be the coordinates of space, x, y, and z. So any scalar that depends on the position in space is a scalar field. And these are the fields I think of as the archetypical examples, things which can vary in space. Air pressure in the atmosphere, or water pressure in the ocean. Temperature. Humidity, again, in the atmosphere. Any similar scalar that depends on position is a scalar field. So now, some examples of how the functions may look. These are all scalar fields on R2, or on some subset of R2 where they are defined. Any expression like this in X and Y will produce a scalar field. Here are six expressions, so they are all scalar fields. I already hinted when I said where they are defined, but the domain of a scalar field is now a subset of R2 or R3 where the formulas are defined. Look at these six functions again. For what values of x and y can these expressions work? Can they be calculated? The first, second, and fourth have no domain restrictions. These polynomials and trig functions have no undefined points. The square roots in the fifth and the sixth give restrictions. In the fifth, since there are two individual square roots, both x and y have to be positive, so the domain must be the first quadrant in R2. For the sixth, the entire expression in the square root needs to be positive. So x squared plus y squared needs to be less than 4. And that gives a circle in R2. So the domain here is a solid filled-in circle. A key idea here is that the domain is a region in R2, not an interval in the number line. Finally, the third here is quite odd. This is a good example of how domains of functions can suddenly become quite a bit more strange for scalar fields compared to single variable functions. This exponent needs to be defined, x to the y. If y is an integer, x can be anything, well, except for zero if y is negative. However, if y is a fraction, then this might involve an even root, and x might need to be positive for those fractions that have an even denominator. And finally, if y is irrational, this is even more difficult to figure out. 
The subset of points in R2 that work for this function isn't really even drawable with all these special cases. And the point here is that domains can be quite difficult and quite hard to understand. Finally, let me talk about graphs and visualizations of functions. For single variable functions, the graph was a way to see what the function was doing. For scalar fields, a graph is still pretty useful. What was a graph of a single variable function? It was a diagram that showed both the input and the output, and the same is true here. A graph of a scalar field is a set of points in Rn plus 1 that shows the inputs, here n variables, and the output, which is one additional variable. That's the general form, but this is easier to talk about with two variable scalar fields. A graph of a two variable scalar field has to show both inputs and one output. That's three pieces of information, so the graph is in R3. Here's the graph of the scalar field f of xy is 5 divided by x squared plus y squared plus 1. Or at least this is a portion of the graph for inputs between negative 2 and 2 in both variables. I like to think of the graph of a two-variable scalar field as a height function, an altitude. The position in the xy plane is the input. The output is the height above that point. The intuition of height is, I find, pretty useful to think about scalar fields, at least those with two inputs. Note here that I need to draw a 3D picture for the graph of a two-variable scalar field. To draw the graph of a three-variable scalar field requires four dimensions. Therefore, as soon as I go past two-variable scalar fields, drawing the graph is simply no longer possible. And this removes the graph as a useful visualization of the function, though I will still use the idea of a graph and its geometry for higher dimensions even though they can't be visualized. This makes three and more input scalar fields pretty hard to understand since there isn't a nice graph to visualize, but I can rely on a fair bit of intuition built upon the two input scalar field graphs. The intuition of a two variable scalar field as a height function, as altitude, has another useful implication, contour plots. For a two variable scalar field, I can ask when the function has a value equal to some constant. In terms of altitude, this is asking for all points on the surface with a fixed height. What happens if I plot these curves for various values of c in R2, that is, in the domain, in the input space? I get a contour plot. This is a topographical map. It shows the contours of fixed elevation. This is the same function as I showed before, with a hill in the middle of the plane, and the contours near the center are high elevations, and they descend in concentric circles moving outwards. Contour plots are a pretty useful tool to get a sense of the behavior of a two-variable scalar field. Anyone familiar with reading topographical maps, of course, should find this pretty convenient. To show how I can read information out of a contour plot, consider this diagram. In this figure, the low points are to the left and the right, and the high points are up and down in the plane. From this center, moving roughly left and right is descending down into a low area, and moving up or down roughly is to ascend to higher peaks. The shape represented by this contour plot is called a saddle point, but I like to think of it as a mountain pass. To hike from one lower point to another, the pass is the easiest way to get over the ridge. And I can get all this information about the function just by studying these contours. Finally, I can do contours in higher dimensions if I want. I can't draw them as nicely, but they still are useful in some contexts. For any scalar field in any dimension, I can set the scalar field equal to a constant. This is called a level set, and it is the generalization of a contour line. For a three-variable scalar field, the level sets are the shapes in three dimension where the field is constant. So you can think about a surface in the air where the atmosphere or pressure or temperature is constant. And that's the idea of a level set of a particular scalar field.